as we talked about this story at our tech study on Wednesday, one of the first comments that came up was, what a jerk this rich guy is. <laughs> Here he is bragging about how righteous and obedient he is, and then he's all sad and dejected when Jesus tells him to give up his stuff because he's just so doggone selfish. Now that certainly fits with how I've always read this story. How about you? The Bible is not always kind to rich people. There's this guy, of course. But then there's also the rich fool who decides to pull down his barns and build bigger ones, only to be informed that that very night he's going to die. And who could forget Lazarus' rich neighbor in Jesus' parable? The one who dies and finds himself in hell, looking longingly across the chasm at Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. I could go on, but you get the point. Our friend Amos here is particularly hard on rich people. Earlier in chapter 4, he taunts the haughty rich women of Israel, calling them the cows of Bashan. The problem, he says, is that these rich oppress the poor. Elsewhere, he says, they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. Rich people make an easy target for anger and jealousy. They have so much more than we do. They can afford to carry a little bit of our ire, too, right? Maybe we read this story with just a hint of schadenfreude, just the tiniest bit of greed to see haughty people brought low. But let's take another look at this story. If we actually read what's there, we see the man doesn't act imperious or haughty. He doesn't boast about his righteousness or his piety. He simply asks Jesus a question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? It's a question that I have heard asked or talked around in more Bible studies than I can count. I've heard it at baptisms and at funerals, in kitchens and living rooms and parking lots. I think that maybe in all of us there's this little sliver of a doubt that wonders whether eternal life could be true. And if it's true, whether it could be for us. So to the man's question, Jesus gives the standard answer. Be good, he says. To which the man replies, I am. Sure, he says, I know those things, I do them. But I still wonder. I still doubt. Somehow I think maybe that's not enough. Here's a person who knows that his goodness is not good enough. Who knows that, as Jesus says, no one is good but God alone, right? No matter how good we are, no matter how well we behave or how nice we act, we all know that we'll never be as good as we should be. We'll never measure up to the expectations that we have of ourselves or of others. And so for all of this man's good deeds, for all of his righteousness, he still doubts. It is at this point, at this point of vulnerability, that Jesus looks at the man and loves him. Maybe Jesus sees someone who needs reassurance, or someone whose heart is in the right place, even if he's not quite doing it, or someone who's really trying his hardest. Or maybe he just sees another human being opening himself up, being truthful about his merits, but also not hiding his secret shame. Whatever it is that Jesus sees, Mark is careful to point out that he loves him. A detail that both Matthew and Luke leave out in their telling of this same story. And it is in this moment of love that Jesus says what comes next. You lack one thing. Go, sell what you have, give to the poor, then follow me. I don't get the impression he's saying this to test the man, to break him, or to make a point. Jesus isn't making an ultimatum here. He's offering advice, a piece of wisdom that he hopes will help the man find what he's looking for. We may assume that the man goes away sad because he knows he won't get that treasure in heaven because he won't sell what he owns. But Mark never says that. 
He leaves the question open. He simply says, he went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Maybe he's sad because he fully intends to follow through, and he knows how hard that's going to be. As a matter of fact, the story never really even says that the man is rich, right? It just says that he had many possessions, but each of us here has many possessions, enough to fill a house or an apartment, sometimes more, a garage, a storage shed. But we don't consider ourselves rich. When Jesus turns to his disciples, he doesn't say how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. He says how hard it will be for those who have wealth. That's a different thing. He never specifies how much wealth a person has to have before they experience trouble getting into the kingdom. And it's at this point, I think, where the story gets interesting. Maybe it's easy to dislike this rich man, to think he's a jerk or self-righteous or pompous. Maybe it's easy because when we can take this story and make it a weapon against those people that we resent and envy anyway, it's easier for us to swallow. We can draw those lines of distinction between that rich jerk and us. And in so doing, we can attempt to assure ourselves that it won't be hard for us to get into the kingdom of heaven. We can attempt to save ourselves that way, to rely on our own merits, which is kind of what Peter does. After Jesus says how hard it will be for, wealth, for people with wealth to enter the kingdom of heaven, Peter pipes up, Lord, look how much we have given up. We follow you, right? Surely, surely we'll get into the kingdom, is what I hear him saying. The implication, of course, we're not like that poor, sad, rich man. Doesn't that sound kind of pompous? Maybe kind of haughty? What neither Peter nor this allegedly rich man understand is that entering the kingdom of heaven is not something any of us can do. It is, as Jesus says, impossible. It is as impossible as trying to get a camel through the eye of a needle. All of us have possessions. All of us have wealth. Not just things that we own, but those ideas about our own worthiness and beliefs about what make us or others good or bad. We want to be reassured that it's not impossible for us. It might be impossible for others, but not for us to get in. We want to believe that the eye of a needle, that the eye of the needle is actually an oddly small gate in the city wall of Jerusalem. Has anybody heard that one? It's a gate that was so small that you could get a camel through, but you had to unload it first and you had to really work at it. We want to believe that somehow we can wedge it through. But you know what? That's nonsense. There never was such a gate. Who would be stupid enough to build a city gate like that? There never was such a gate. It's impossible. In the story, everyone wonders what they can do. And the answer is nothing. They're asking the wrong question. The question to ask is not, what can I do? It's, what can God do? I'm going to tell you a story. I spent the last two years looking very hard for God. There was a point not that long ago where God seemed to be missing from my daily life, which is odd, considering my daily life is built almost entirely around God. It's an odd place to find oneself as a pastor. During my sabbatical, away from my job, I was able to reconnect and find meaning again, and I've been spending more and more time on my relationship with God since that. Not just, doing, not just while I'm doing my God job, but actually paying attention to and spending time with God. Getting to know myself in God, and getting to know God in myself, as Merton might say. 
Merton, Thomas Merton has been a big help to me in all this, particularly in what I talked about last week, that each and every person is a unique expression of God, that by knowing others, I can be helped in knowing God more fully. And it was in the light of this idea that a couple of weeks ago I came to a realization. I look back on my life and I observe that my experience of God and the people around me is woefully incomplete. I have only ever lived in places where people look like me and think like me and come from similar backgrounds as me. In other words, the only God I know looks like me. I began to wonder, do I know God at all? Or am I just having my own self reflected back at me in the, in the faces that look like mine? I felt in that moment the Holy Spirit calling me into a deeper relationship with God by leaving my white suburban life and going somewhere else. Somewhere to live among people who look and think and act differently from me. In other words, I felt her to, inviting me to do more or less what Jesus asks the man in the story to do. And I got to tell you, folks, I was deeply grieved. I love my life. I am comfortable and I am happy here. But I wondered if I could ever really know God if I didn't do that. It's an impossible choice. What do I do? Do I give up this house, this call, this, in order to pursue a deeper relationship with God? Or do I, do, do I give up on God in order to continue, continue life on my own terms? I was really in a pickle. But I continued to think about it and to pray about it. And over the next few days, and with the help of this story, I began to realize something that I hadn't thought of before. I realized that I was thinking it was up to me to find my own way through the eye of the needle and into God's kingdom. I felt that it was up to me to get to know God more fully. And maybe it is. Maybe God is calling me to that. But even if I were to spend the rest of my life traveling the globe and meeting God in the face of every single human person alive, I would still never know God fully, right? That's not something that's available to us. I will never know God fully, not while I walk this earth. For mortals, it is impossible. But not for God. For God, all things are possible. That's what I began to see, that God will continue to invite me into deeper relationship, regardless of what I give up or hang on to. And that's not to say that my decisions don't have consequences, won't make that harder or easier. God will continue to invite me to give up what is holding me back from knowing God more fully. To give up what holds me back from following, just like Jesus does for the rich man. And although I trust that God will bring me into the kingdom either way because nothing is impossible with God, I am left to discern for myself how hard it will be for me to get there. Will I enter by the gate, or will I be crammed through the eye of a needle? What will I let go of for the sake of discipleship? That's a question I'm going to have to continue to wrestle with. I think... As long as we think of ourselves as different from the man in this story, the one we call rich or self-righteous or selfish, we can pretend that we are better and we can rest in that self-assurance. We can believe that it is what we have or what we do, our wealth, that saves us. But if we let the illusion of separation die, if we see ourselves as one with him, as one with his doubts and the many, his many possessions, maybe we can join him in asking that hard question. Maybe we can even join him in being saved by the answer. The author to the letter of Hebrews says, the word of God is sharper than any, any two-edged sword, 
piercing until it divides bone from marrow. I wonder, what if after all these weeks of talking about amputating limbs and divorcing spouses, this story is one more invitation from Jesus to let go of what keeps us from knowing God more fully. Thomas Merton recognized God in his own poverty, in his total and utter lack of anything with which he might commend himself or reassure himself that he was worthy. He saw that because it was only in that poverty that he recognized God because only God can love when there's no reason to love. I wonder if in this story the man's grief as he leaves Jesus is not his salvation. That that's what keeps him from being comfortable and complacent. His grief comes from recognizing that his possessions can't save him. That in the end, really, they can only hold him back. What if it's his grief that finally allows him to know what it is to be loved? Not for his righteousness or his wealth but regardless of those things. What if the invitation of this story is to feel the, weir- the word of God piercing us, cleaving soul from spirit, bone from marrow, and to live in that discomfort? <laughs>